today on Super Soul Sunday. Author, seeker, and spiritual trailblazer Elizabeth Gilbert is here. Her blockbuster book, Eat, Pray, Love, was an awakening for millions of women around the world. But Elizabeth's epic journey of self-discovery has only just begun. There's always another level up, more grace, more light. Whoa. She says the power to be our own hero lies within us. Don't give up on that question in you about your place within the world. The only thing we have to do is answer the call. If you're going to answer the call, get ready, get ready. <laughs> what is your own quest? And what's holding you back? Women have come up to me and said, I would love nothing more than to do what you did, but I can't because I have A, B, C, D, E obstacles. Elizabeth has practical advice to get you unstuck. You might not be able to begin your quest today, but you gotta get your plan. I just love that. Part one of my two-part conversation with Elizabeth Gilbert. Good stuff. Oh, thank you, thank you. Starts right now. I wanted a place for us to go every Sunday to wake up. I just had an aha there. Thought provoking. <laughs> Ow, I never thought of that before. Eye opening. Ooh, that's good. And inspiring. It's fantastic, aren't you loving this love conversation? It. We're making every moment count yes. together. <laughs> Where else can you experience anything like this? Get your child. This is Super Soul Sunday. So you know her as the author of Each Pray, Love. So many people do. And her memoir sold more than 15 million copies, appearing more than, was it 200 weeks? It was, it was a long time. It was a long time. More than 200 weeks on New York Times bestseller. Yeah. That's like almost four years. Yeah. And the story has just reached into almost every corner of the world where women have access to reading and touch women's lives. It's a beautiful, rare, and amazing thing. When Eat, Pray, Love was first published, Elizabeth appeared on The Oprah Show to talk about how her book had sparked a revolution and stirred something up for millions of women. People have come to me and said, you know, how can I do what you did? And I'm like, well, first of all, you shouldn't do what I did. The only thing you need to do is ask yourself the questions I was asking myself. And if you listen to that, I guarantee that you'll get your own journey. Little did Elizabeth know the next leg of her own journey was just beginning. She married the Brazilian man that readers fell in love with in the book, whose real name is Jose. Making peace with this idea of being married again was not easy. She documented that soul-churning process in her follow-up book, Committed. After eight years of writing about her own life, Elizabeth returned to her roots, fiction writing, in The Signature of All Things, Elizabeth created a passionate, independent-thinking heroine, not unlike herself, Alma Whitaker. This daring novel about a 19th-century botanist quickly attracted excited readers and accolades from critics. In the fall of 2014, I was thrilled to have Elizabeth join me on the Life You Want Tour. I'm here today to talk to you about the stories that we tell about our lives. Thousands of women cheer when they hear her urgent message. You can take the lead and be the hero of your own story. On stage or with her beautiful writing, Elizabeth aims to inspire. The phenomenal success of Eat, Pray, Love was just a hint of what was to come. People will come up to me and they'll say, I'm sure you hear this all the time. Yeah. They always begin it with that, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you hear this all the time but your book changed my life. And I'm still capable of bursting into tears at that because I don't mind hearing it again. I really don't. You know what? I yeah, really don't mind Because people it. hear a lot of bad stuff in their life because and that's a great thing. Because it's your life that got changed? Yeah. Like I've heard it from someone else, but not from you, your life. Yes. Like, it's amazing. But what does that mean? I would say when somebody says, you changed my life, yeah. I'd say, and what does that mean? Right, right. Tell me in about that. In what way? What yeah. did it, you know, show? Yeah. Um, I feel like what I'm hearing from people mostly about it is that for some reason, and this just boggles my imagination, there are still just huge swaths of women who never got the memo that their lives belong to them. And there's this instinct that they have that they need a permission slip from the principal's office for anything, uh. you know? And I feel like in a way, 
Eat, Pray, Love kind of was a permission slip from the principal's yes. office that said, you are allowed to ask yourself some really important questions about your life. You are allowed to take accountability and ownership for your own journey. You're allowed to ask what serves you sometimes, um, because I know you've been trained up to serve everyone, but you're allowed to turn that on yourself and honor your own life that you were given. And I feel like it just got to people somehow that they hadn't quite put together that they could do that. Yet. You know what is so fascinating? Uh, you know, we're doing the Life You Want tour, but one of the things that I think, I just see people like enraptured over your words. Oh. When you say, I did the same thing that my mother did and her mother did and her mother did and her mother did. And people can see themselves in that because we've just sort of, so many people, I broke the chain for my, my, my family cycle, right. but so many women have just done the thing that was always done. 13th you, grade. Thir 13th grade. You get married. <laughs> you do the, and you just <laughs> it's do. It's the next thing. And yes. Then and you, comes the baby. Then come, you know, and it's just not thought. It's not always chosen. Yes. It's a reflex. And the idea that you have the ability to change that if you want to. Yeah. Even if, and the story that you tell on stage, even if you can't leave where you are right now and right. go on your own quest. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, well, that story I love so much because for years, years, women have come up to me and said some variation of this. I would love nothing more than to do what you did, to, to drop everything and run and to go on a quest and to travel around the world and find my true self, but I can't because I have A, B, C, D, E obstacles. Yes. It's, I have an elderly relative who I take care of. I have uh, you, you know, young children who rely on me. I'm the provider for this household. I have contracts with people who I love and who need me, and I can't just run away from them. And I've, and I've struggled over the years to figure out how to answer that when they say, how can I go on my quest when I'm in that situation, which is most people to be yes, honest. Yeah. Um, and I got my answer a couple of years ago in a bookstore in Washington, DC. A woman came up after the signing and she said, I want to tell you about my mother. And she told me this story. Do I have time to, you have to time bring to it here? It? Her story is about her mother who was Irish Catholic, grew up in a very traditional restrictive household in the 50s, did what her mother and grandmother and grandmother and grandmother did, got married at 18, had five kids in a row. And when the oldest was 10 and the youngest was two months, her husband left her and never came back. And she was alone to raise this no, family. Just picture that. The oldest is 10. The youngest is two months. You're 28. You're tw you have a high no, school education. No, as you're telling that story, I can't, you know, I'm thinking, where was I when I was 28? And just the idea of managing a, 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 a Yeah. You even had, if it was one. Even if it was one. You know, it's five. And, five kids. And the heartbreak of somebody walking out on you, too, that you have to process in addition to so rallying. So husband got tired, got fed up, couldn't whatever. Take it, they never heard from him again. Left. Took a train. Left. Um, and, and she had to figure out how to hold that family together, and she did. And I don't know the details of how she did it. I just know she's heroic. She did it. But she did something else, too, which is that she made a decision that very day that she realized he was never coming home, that her life was not always going to look like this, this much sorrow, this much oppression, this much poverty. And she made a promise to herself that someday she was going to see the world. And then she got a coffee can, just a regular, humble, empty coffee can, stuck it in the back of her closet where her kids couldn't see it, and starting on that very day that her husband left her, she put one dollar in that coffee can and started a practice every day, one dollar. No matter what it took to get it, because it wasn't always easy to get it, but she figured her family was always desperate, always poor. There was never a day when one dollar was gonna break them. She could spare that and sacrifice for it. And it took her 20 years until all those kids were grown. She never touched that money, she just added to it, coffee can after coffee can after coffee can. And when the last kid was out of the house, she cashed in the coffee cans. She bought herself a ticket on a freighter ship and she sailed around the world alone as she had always promised herself that she would do. So the message of that is you might not be able to begin your quest today, but you've got to get your plan, get your coffee cans going, take the long view if you need to, but don't give up on that question in you about the world and your place within the world. Take whatever time you need Make your plan and begin today. I just love that story. Me too. And now are women writing to you and telling you about their coffee cans? Suddenly it's the coffee can revolution, right? All over yeah. Twitter, they're sending me pictures. I started my coffee can today, or they're dialoguing. They were, some were like, I got my Oprah chai tin from Starbucks. That's a I'm, good, that's a good can. I'm like, whatever the vessel, doesn't matter. Somebody's like, all I have is an old pickle jar. Is that okay? 
Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> it's a shoebox. It's I don't a shoe care. Box. It's okay. It's a plastic bag. I don't care. But begin honoring your quest and your journey by making that commitment that every single day you're going to do something because you're either going away from it or you're going toward it, right? Yes. Whatever your destiny is. Yeah. Coming up, what's holding you back from beginning your own quest? I feel like almost every question that women come to me with on Facebook, on Twitter, in person, when they're stuck, it's fear. Super Solars, as Elizabeth said, the coffee can revolution is just beginning. What's your coffee can plan? Tell me one little thing you can start doing today. Facebook or tweet it using the hashtag Super Soul Sunday. Back in a moment. At 31, Elizabeth Gilbert seemed to have it all. A beautiful home, a thriving career, and a happy marriage. But underneath her glowing success, she was filled with despair. Desperate to free herself from a life she felt was not her own, she divorced her husband and set off on a spiritual quest that took her to Italy, to India, and Bali. That transformative experience became her best-selling memoir, Eat, Pray, Love. This entire story began on my knees, on a floor, praying. I don't want to be married anymore. I don't want to live in this big house. I don't want to have a baby. Today, with more than 15 million copies in 46 different languages, Elizabeth has inspired a generation of women around the world to seek their own heart's journey. Do women write to you all the time trying to figure out how to stay on course for the quest for themselves? Do they, do they write to you about that? They do, and, and honestly, I feel like, and I think Pema Chodron, mm -hmm. who we both love, yes. She says, the older I get, the more I think every problem is just fear. And I feel like I'm seeing that too because the questions that people come to me with seem to always boil down to some version of fear. It's either I'm stuck and I'm scared to make a move to make a change, or it's um, what I call the haute couture high-end version of fear, which is perfectionism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, until the path is perfect, oh, until the perfect, way- the haute couture. You know? Yes, because perfectionism is its own thing. Perfectionism is just a real But it's glossy. also, I'm really scared of not... It's just fear. Of, of, ...of presenting myself in a way that doesn't look like I'm perfect. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just fear in, like, really good shoes, mm -hmm. you know? But it's still fear. And I feel like almost every question that women come to me with on Facebook, on Twitter, in person, when they're stuck, it's fear. What amazes me is that you, you started this revolution. You weren't trying to start a revolution. You were just taking care of your own self. And wrote this book, Eat, Pray, Love. And even now, as we're on the Life You Want tour, I saw a Facebook post that you did the other day. I was just sort of in bed and I was scanning and I wanted to thank all the people who'd come out um, to Detroit, I think it was. Yeah. And I was, you know, went to post something and I saw this post from you thanking me, which just really, open my heart in such a way. Oh, but you're giving such an incredible thing, not just what I was trying to convey in that post is that you're not just giving this to the 10,000 people who came to be there. You're giving it to me and I'm allegedly there as a teacher, but I'm actually there as a student because I'm only talking for 45 minutes and the rest yes. of the weekend, you see me, I'm on the, like this, on the edge of my chair. So that's like, what I wanted to talk to you about. drinking it that in. That you say that I'm just there taking notes emotionally, spiritually, and literally in the guise of a student when I'm not speaking, which is really only for 45 minutes. I'm sitting in the front row with my heart, mind wide open, and I'm learning from Mark Nepo and Rob Bell and Ianla and Deepak, from the brave audience members who rise to speak, from everyone who's there to share and to grow. And then you go on to tell this beautiful story mm -hmm. that your friend shared. Yeah. Yeah, can you tell us about that story? I love this. I brought my best friend to the, yes. the life you want to her, my best friend, Rhea Elias, um, who's my, she got to meet Gail, and she said, say, She's your Gail. She said to Gail, I'm, your, I'm Liz's Gail. <laughs> Which is what people they say to so, me all the time. They say it, and, and yeah. Gail is so sweet. I'm like, she was so gracious about it. Um, so we were both on fire when we came home from the weekend because we were just sharing and bouncing off everything that we had heard. And I was saying, isn't it incredible? Because you and I do this work. Like, we, we show up for our lives. We are present in the day. We are yes. trying to bring the light. We are, like, always, and yet there's always another 
ascension mm -hmm. that you can do. And Rhea, who used to be a heroin addict and homeless and in prison and, you know, just like a lost soul who pulled herself up from that. She said, back when I was a junkie, I used to say, you think you hit rock bottom, there's always another trap door, there's always another bottom, there's always another bottom, there's always something lower. And she said, and now I'm in this moment in my life where I think it's good and it's fine and I've figured out so much and I'm full of grace and full of life and gratitude, but there's always another level up. There's always another ascension, more grace, more light, more generosity, more compassion, more to shed, more to grow. And that's how I felt when I came over that weekend and I wrote on that, that Oprah did that. She just gave me a rope ladder up to another level of my soul. We all did that. I love that. Another rope ladder up to my soul. Coming up. You were at the point where the choice to stay would have been worse than scarier daring than leaving. to. Yeah, scarier than leaving. Yeah. How Elizabeth dug deep and gathered the courage to make a change. The difference is I wanted something else. I was made to be something else. Super Soul Sunday, we'll be right back. On Super Soul Sunday, we often talk about American author and mythologist Joseph Campbell. He coined the phrase, the hero's journey, capturing thousands of years of storytelling in that single phrase. Elizabeth is also fascinated by his work and was curious as to why the hero's journey rarely had a woman as the center of the story. Now, what I love that you're talking about on this Life You Want tour is the hero's journey. And I, who have loved Joseph Campbell and quoted Joseph Campbell and talked about following your bliss and, you know, all, you know so many wonderful Joseph Campbell quotes, I never knew that he felt that way about women in the journey. Well, we love Joseph Campbell and we yes. should love him. And I do love him and I still love him. You know, um, and he was just the reporter, really. Yes. I mean, in a way, it wasn't his, it wasn't that he was a misogynist. It was that he was accurately reporting that world history. There, there, there are no women in the hero's Which journey. Which is, guess what? Let's talk about the hero's yeah. journey. Yeah, so the hero's journey. So Joseph Campbell, great 20th century scholar and teacher, a real master, a real encompassing genius, spent his entire life studying the myths, the fairy tales, and the religious origins of every culture on Earth, looking for common threads, right? And he discovered that there's this one story that never stops being told. And it's been told since we became human, we're telling it now, we tell it in every language of the world, it never goes away, and that's the hero's journey. And it's very recognizable, it's Luke Skywalker, it's Odysseus, it's Moses, it's Nemo, it's yeah. Bambi, yes. you know? And it's a restless youngster who gets called to the journey, goes through the road of trials, um, suffers through dark nights of the soul, finds his teachers, faces the battle, loses his fear. That's the shorthand for the hero's journey. We need that story. It's a beautiful story. It inspires us, it shows us the way, but it's never included women. And that's a big oversight, mm -hmm. that the most important human story that has ever existed doesn't include women, except as side characters. You can be the hero's mom. Yeah. You can be the helpless virgin. You can be the, yes. the old crone. Right. But you can't be the hero, that's only for men. Um, and I had a problem with that. <laughs> and Joseph Campbell got challenged on that a lot by a lot by of young female women students, yeah. who would just say, can you please give us some examples of the female hero's journey? And he would and say, say, no. Because it doesn't exist. doesn't exist. And then he would give the reason, which I also have problems with. Um, and he would say, the reason is that women don't need to go on the hero's journey because the hero's journey is all about the process through which a broken person becomes whole. Women don't need to do that process because women aren't broken. Women mm -hmm. have no unresolved emotional issues. You and I know that. Yes, yeah, right. um, women are totally whole already because women possess this extraordinary power. They're the life givers. They're the womb. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're the only ones who can generate life on earth. And therefore, their purpose is obvious, which yeah. is to have babies and only yeah. to have babies. As you're, saying, if you're, as you're standing on stage saying that as we're traveling the country, I mean, I just marvel at the fact that you and I and every other woman watching were born at this time. Oh, so lucky. Because you talk about the fact that, and I don't think we as women people appreciate it enough, oh. that really we're the first generation that really has been allowed to choose to, for ourselves. To write our own story. And to write our own story. The first, and, and I say it all the time, we're a new species. But it's humans. astonishing. It's just astonishing. And the problem and the part, reason that sometimes we feel half, in, half insane is that we don't have what men have. We don't have 30,000 years of role models yeah. to show us how to be the hero. 
We don't have any, really, until very recently. That's right. We don't have Odysseus. We don't have Moses. We don't, you know, we... Odysseus is out there. Anybody, yeah. He's out there sailing around the world. Where's Penelope, his wife? She's got that big scene at the loom, weaving and weaving and weaving and waiting. And waiting. And waiting waiting. waiting for something to change to her life. Yeah. Because she has no agency other than her job, which is to be loyal and faithful. Well, he's out there sleeping with goddesses and sailing around the world. You know, Um, so so it's, it's understandable to me when women hesitate on the brink of the journey and wonder... No wonder they don't feel like they have permission to do this. No wonder it's scary. Who did this before? Your grandmother didn't do this. Right. You know, maybe your grandmother did if you were like British aristocracy and she was, but probably not. But for you at the point of literally um, not not a nervous breakdown, but breaking down emotionally, you were at the point where the choice to stay would have been worse than scarier daring than leaving. To, yeah. yeah, scarier than leaving. Yeah, that's when we that, change mostly, yes, right? Yeah. I mean, unless you're really evolved, you usually don't do the work to change until yeah. not changing gets is, worse. Is that Anais Din, that quote? Yes, yeah. Something like, until the status quo is actually scarier than the transformation. Right. Um, yeah, and, and, and I had to step up and stand on my own two feet and say, this life is not my destiny and I have to leave. And it was terrifying. And, and it's also hard, we spoke earlier about doing what your mom did, doing what your grandmother did, doing what every, all my aunts did, every woman I ever knew yeah. got married. Yeah. And what everybody expects you to do when there's something right. else calling inside of you that says, this ain't it. This, this is ain't not it. it. This, this is, is not, not my it. dream. Yeah. You know, um, this is not my path. And it's especially hard. See, I don't, my mother, I don't come from a dysfunctional family. I really admire and revere my mother it's really hard not to imitate your mother when you admire and revere her. Yeah. Um, Because I wanted to be like her. She was strong. She was capable. She was competent. She was beautiful. I got married the same age she did. Of course I did. You know, the difference is I wanted something else. I was made to be something else. Coming up, it's the one question we've all asked. What have I come here to do with my life? Are you listening for the answer? Now you can choose to ignore that question or you can pursue it. And the pursuit is the beginning of the journey. Super Soul Sunday will be right back. Eat, Pray, Love is a memoir of Elizabeth Gilbert's year-long quest around the world, searching for her true self. It is her own hero's journey. So do you believe that the hero's journey is a part of our DNA? Yeah, I do. Um, And Joseph Campbell made that argument really persuasively, and the best evidence there ever is of that is that it's told, that story, precisely the same way, has never been told any differently, and it's told precisely the same way in societies around the world that have never heard of each other. You know, you go to like the middle of Papua New Guinea and you ask them what their great heroic tale is and they're gonna tell you Moses, Jason and the Argonauts, yeah. Luke Skywalker. Like, they're, like the names of the heroes change and the settings change, but the path is so much exactly the same that it really is kind of the blueprint for enduring difficulty. So it always begins with the call. The call starts the thing. And then the refusal of the call. First comes the call, then comes Don't ask me to do this. Don't take this cup away from me. Yes. I'm not a hero. Don't look at me. I don't have the power. I'm just a kid. I'm just a regular guy. Yeah. The call won't leave you alone, though. And then you begin the journey. Yeah. And then comes the road of trials, which we all know because we've all been there. It's so interesting because I'm just, uh, I'm a producer on the movie Selma. And, you know, Martin Luther King, classic, classic Mm -hmm. hero's journey. You get the call. Yeah. Doesn't really want. Don't ask me. Don't ask me to do it. I just want to have a normal life and have a church. And, and, and be a nice preacher, but I'm can't not your hero. A call. Yeah, I'm not your hero. And, yeah. and Destiny's like, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Or, and you know, I say you can, you can answer the call or you can refuse the call. Really, he could have refused the call. He could have refused the call. He could have insistently said, it's not me. But he chose to answer it. And doesn't it make for a better story? <laughs> you know? Do you think the call is the same for men and women, that we all have that calling, that yearning to step out? Yes. I absolutely do. Whether you choose to hear it or not. I absolutely do. I think that call comes in the middle of the night 
And the call begins, I mean, look, the word quest mm -hmm. is question, right? Like every mm -hmm. quest begins with a question. And the question's always the same question. How do you know, though, that you're being called to something? What are the signs? You get the question, here's the question. What have I come here to do with my life? You telling me you never got that question? That's the question that begins every single quest. What have I come here to do with my life? There's no one who hasn't had that question come to them. That's the call. Correct. That's the call. It's like whispering. If you haven't, you're, you're pretty. No, you're just pretty. You're numb really out. not paying attention. You're really not paying. <laughs> you're attention. really watching Breaking Bad at four in the morning and eating ice cream, and you're really not listening. You're not listening. Yeah, because, because everybody's gotten in everybody. one form or another. Yeah. That what have is I come the call. Here to do with my life. What have I come here to do with my life? Now you can choose to ignore that question, or you can pursue it. And the pursuit is the beginning of the journey. Coming up, ready to answer the call? Elizabeth says, you better buckle up. If you're doing this, if you're going to answer the call and you're going to transform and you're going to change. really step up to who you're supposed to be in the world. Get ready. Get ready. <laughs> and later, how Elizabeth created her own kind of superhero. Alma's journey takes us on a journey through a woman's life, through science, through the great movements of the 19th century. Super Soul Sunday. We'll be back in a moment. Author Joseph Campbell said that when heroes answer the call, it's not without self-doubt first, then a point of no return, which leads to a battle. Like Dorothy's hesitant first steps down the mysterious yellow brick road that led her home, even a defiant young Luke Skywalker finally discovered the power of the Force within. Now, isn't it true, though, I've, I, I, I just, I knew this for myself, when there came a time for me to leave Baltimore, and everybody around me was saying, no, you, there's no way you're gonna succeed. I didn't hear it as much as I felt it. Mm -hmm. I felt that if I didn't move right. from where I was, for whatever I was being called to here, obviously, in Chicago, yeah. I felt if I didn't do it, that a part of me would die. I felt that I would just, I would just sort of like, not physically die, but that a part of me would sort of shrivel up in some way, and that I would not be emotionally, spiritually myself. I Did you feel you. that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you felt that too? Yes, absolutely. And I had a friend who said to me, you stay on this path, you, you're gonna, you're gonna, you might actually die. Yeah. Like, you might get very sick, you might crash yeah. your car into yeah. a tree, yeah. like, you might get so depressed that, you know, like, you might literally die if you don't change. Really? Um, and, and I, well, I that heard is, that. I think, what makes people sick. They just, parts of them just... You just atrophy. Atrophy, you know? yeah. Um, like you just, like you die in pieces. And, um, and we've all seen people who have sort of shut down in pieces yeah. and, and died. Um, and also that feeling that you kind of don't have a choice, right? Like, um, I had the same thing when I used to tell people when, when I was a teenager that I was gonna be a writer. Like, what a, nobody ever said, <laughs> here's a line you never hear. Oh yeah, that's where the big money is, kid. You know, like follow that. <laughs> that's an easy path. You'll get there. You know, like no one ever in history said that. It didn't matter what they said because I had no choice. This is what I, I knew. This is what I came here to do. I don't have to succeed. Um, succeeding means answering the question, following the quest. Yeah. Wherever it ends. You know, the point is like, did you try? You know, did you and a part of the call, show up? Yes, and a part of what you what you make so clear is that a, everybody gets called. You can choose to answer it or not. Once you do answer it, you're going to be faced with obstacles and challenges and people who look like friends or not. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not easy. Yeah, like I mean, I think what I really try to communicate with people is that we try. We're a little bit delusional in this society. The way we sell changing your life as if it's something like fun. Whoa. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. And, and what I say is, like, if, you, if you're doing this, if you're gonna answer the call, mm -hmm. and you're gonna transform and you're gonna change. Really step up to who you're supposed to be in the world? Get ready. Get ready. <laughs> yeah. It is not a day at the beach. Like, you know, expect to be challenged. Expect to be hurt. Expect to feel lost. Expect to feel despair. Expect to be double guessing yourself at every turn. Like, am I, because that's what the, Road of, they don't call it the road of trials because it's like a joyride. 
You know, they call yeah. it the road of, the, Joseph Campbell called it the road of trials because that's exactly what it is. But every single one of those obstacles, challenges and temptations that you have to learn to manage will help you gain your talents and powers and shed your fears so that when it comes time for the climactic scene in every hero's journey, which is the battle, you're ready. Because every single one of those obstacles, obstacles prepared, prepared you for, you for the, the battle. battle. Yeah. You know, and then, then you lose your fear and then you become the hero. What was your actual battle? So we know the leaving, the going out, the eating, the praying. The, what was the real battle? The real battle for me was my own self-abuse um, was to learn how to stop, how to drop the knife that I was holding to my own throat so that I was never good enough. I was never, you know, I couldn't let go of my failures. I couldn't let go of my shame. I couldn't let go of, of anything wrong I had ever done. I had an inventory that was so long and that happened in India. Because, and I'll remember, I remember it very well because I was in four months of meditation and that, that was my battle, was the four months in that meditation cave, alone, with no distraction, no friends, nothing except me and it. And the it was the anger, the sadness, the sorrow, the shame, the pain. And, it, and we were in there. Yeah. You know, my head, like most of our heads, is a neighborhood you don't want to walk around alone in at night. That's right. You know, it's not nice in there. And when you're forced to be there, and I just remember the day that I finally, this was my victory in my battle. All my demons, all my monsters that I'd been carrying around forever, the light came through and I realized, oh, they're not demons, they're not monsters, they're not dragons. I've been making them more grandiose than they are. They're just the orphaned parts of me. They're just the fearfulest, most young, terrified parts of me. They are scared to death and they are throwing temper tantrums because of their fear. And now I have to tell them that it's going to be okay and they will all go to sleep. I am the mother of all of these parts of me. And I remember just sort of in my mind ascending above them all and just saying, I love you, fear, and now you go to sleep. I love you, anger. You're part of me. Go to sleep. It's fine. I'm in charge now. I love you, shame. Even you. Come into my heart. Go to sleep. You're safe. I love you. I'm not leaving you. I can't. You're part of me. You're part of the family. You're never going to be away from me. I love you, failure. Come into my heart. Rest. You're so tired. You're so scared. You're just children. You don't know how the world works. I love all of you. I have space for all of you. And together, we're just going to go forward now. But mommy's driving now. And mommy is the part of me who can embrace everything that I am in peace. Well, let's take a quick break. Boy, that's beautiful, Liz. Coming up, what Elizabeth learned after facing down her inner demons. Any voice that you have that attacks you in any way is not your highest self. Plus, in this week's Super Soul Short. It's not enough for me to just hear about something or read about something. I want to know it in my bones. How following her bliss inspired Elizabeth to create a most unlikely heroine. Back in a moment. I think so many people think like, oh, if you wrote that book and you conquered your own dark night of the soul where the hero finds he's lost and questions everything. What was your dark night? Oh God, I had so many of them. I had a string of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting um, when you quieted all the fears, that was a dark, was that a dark what night? What I did, I had a, you know, I think my, my reckoning was that I went away for 10 days once um, during that time to be in absolute silence for 10 days. No books, no writing, no, you know, just went to this island, 10 days of silence. And I, I think I wept out 10 lifetimes of sorrow. I would just walk around this island sobbing, praying, talking, and just being like, and I remember feeling like it was a peace summit in a way. I was like, all you guys, these are the, the battling demons. We're all going to have to figure out how to work together here because we can't be like this. Like, we're going to have to figure out how to integrate this thing called a self. What did you learn about yourself? That any voice that you have that attacks you in any way is not your highest self. And I think the trick that we fall into sometimes is that I feel like we have these three layers of self. We've got little scared kid, we've got 
older sister perfectionist judge who we think is the higher self, right? So little scared kid is like, I want all that ice cream because mm -hmm. I need it because I'm hungry and I'm scared. Older sister scared judge says, you idiot. You know, like, that's You're always you always like, yeah. when are you going to stop doing this to yourself? When are you going to like, and, and you think that's your higher, your self. higher self because it knows more because clearly it's right in a way. Like you can't keep abusing yourself like this. But if it's speaking to you in that tone, I can guarantee you that is not the voice of God and that is not your channel to God because it doesn't come in that tone. If it's doing any of this, mm -hmm. it's just a judge inside you, but it is not grace because you'll know grace when you hear it because grace says, I don't care what you do, you're splendid and magnificent and I'm here and I'm right beside you and we're gonna get through this. That is the only thing grace ever says. It never says you screwed up. It never says you gotta do better. Mm -hmm. Like grace never says that. You say that. Yes, that's right. You know, grace just says, love, come, embrace, safe, us, peace. You'll know it when you hear it. Is that what you call God, grace? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. You know, it's, it's I said this to you before, God is, the simplest definition I've ever is whatever lifts your face out of the dirt. Because <laughs> we do spend a lot of our lives kind of like in the mud, you know? And anything that lifts that and ascends you and, and gently comes and just says, rise, 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 that's grace calling. Next time on Super Soul Sunday, our conversation, ah, just getting started. It's just a joy to talk to you. Elizabeth shares more of her signature That's wisdom. I'm in charge of this soul that was given to me to take care of. Wow, what a powerful right? thing to say. And how taking even the smallest steps can lead to your heart's truest desire. You talk about miniature quests. Yeah, mini quests, fun yes, size. Yes, <laughs> fun size. Sometimes, Snackable quests. Sometimes quest. you have to shape the quest of the reality of your life. It's part two of our inspiring conversation over chai. You won't want to miss it. In this week's Super Soul Short, Elizabeth Gilbert walks us through the inspiration behind her best-selling novel, The Signature of All Things. My family had this extraordinary 1783 edition of Captain Cook's Voyages, leather-bound to look like something in a magician's library. I spent a lot of my childhood opening it up and gazing at these exotic maps and these extraordinary illustrations. And it was through my fascination with those botanical explorers and illustrators that my book was born. The signature of all things is the name of a 16th century theory that was posited by this German mystic who believed that God had imprinted a message into the shape and form of every plant on earth about what that plant was for. Alma Whitaker is the daughter of an extraordinary botanical explorer who had traveled as a young man on Captain Cook's voyages around the world. And Alma, therefore, is born into this rarefied world. She has access to one of the greatest libraries in the New World. The world is at her fingertips except for literally. She cannot leave the estate. She is her father's assistant, his secretary. He needs her and her intellectual restlessness has been causing depression and fear. What is she gonna do with this great mind? And then one day she grabs a giant magnifying lens and goes outside and discovers this entire universe of mosses and realizes that there are varieties that nobody has ever studied. It's literally underfoot and she herself relates to the mosses and sort of identifies with them and realizes that this could be her world. and she begins to unravel some of the central mysteries of evolution. I know that there are very few greater pleasures in life than to completely be subsumed by the work that you're obsessed with, and that's completely who she is, and that is totally based on me. <laughs> it's not enough for me to just hear about something or read about something. I wanna know it in my bones. I want to go out and roll around in the world that I'm inventing. And just as I had to go all the way to the French Polynesian archipelago that would be just the right place, I also had to come and find the mansion that would be just the right place for Alma. This place, Woodlands, had so many pieces of inspiration for me so that when I'm writing through these pages, I'm actually walking in my memory through these places where I've been. 
Alma's journey takes us on a journey through the world, through a century, through a woman's life, through science, through the great movements of the 19th century. When you read Dickens, you feel like he's taking you by the hand and saying, don't worry, I got this. Come with me, we are going to have the most amazing encounter together. And that's the feeling that I wanted this book to convey, that from the very first page, I'm going to take you on a voyage and we're going to go very far together through time and through space and through history. And when we come back on the other side, we'll be changed.